Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to go ahead on and read the text, y'all, and we're going to get into it. The Bible says in Joel, Joel chapter 2, verse 17 through 18. Joel chapter 2, verse 17 through 18, y'all. I'm going to read the text. The Bible says, let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. And do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nation should rule over them. Why should among your peoples, why should they say among your people, where is their God? Verse 18, y'all. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. Father, we thank you for your word, God. Have your way, Master. O King, we love your word, God. Ooh. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. So, y'all, we've been going through this um this series, man, and, and we done covered, man, our first three points, y'all. You know, the Bible talk about that, that this book was written by Joel himself, y'all. The prophet Joel himself writ, writ, um, wrote this book. Can we see this in verse 1? The Bible said a word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Pinu, y'all. And all commentators agree that it was him that penned this, this, this book of Joel, this prophecy, y'all, like I say, y'all. Because Joel is prophesying about a New Testament time. He's prophesying about a, a future time to come in these last days all the way from the Old Testament. The Most High is speaking through him, y'all. And that's how the, the gift of the prophet worked, y'all. And we just went in, man, and we went in looking at our first point, um, just going deep into understanding of the day of the Lord. Because as you study this book, you see that in every chapter, Joel, he pins this phrase, the day of the Lord. Chapter 1, chapter 2. The day of the Lord, yo. Chapter 3, the day of the Lord. And we went in just breaking down, getting the understanding of this day of the Lord. And then we moved to our second point, let the priest, yo. And we talked about the priest. How Joel called unto the priest, but that it wasn't Joel because it was God who spoke through Joel, yo. Who called unto the priest. He said, let the priest. And this is so amazing because Joel is in the Old Testament. And God got him prophesying, yelling out, let the priest. Calling unto the office of the priest, y'all. Not in the Levitical days, we say. Not in the Old Testament times. Not in the priesthood under Aaron, y'all. But we said it, it's talking about the priesthood under our high priest who is Jesus Christ the righteous, y'all. <laughs> not under the order of, of Melchizedek, not under the order of Aaron, but at, under the order of Melchizedek, y'all. And we covered that. Who is an incarnated Christ, y'all, who came in the flesh. You know what I'm saying? And we just went in about that. And then we got to our third point, y'all, talking about weeping between the porch and the altar. And that's where we're going to pick up. And um, God kind of dealt with me, man. So we're going to kind of shift and we're going to deal with something that I kind of spoke about last time. And we're going to go in depth with it. And it's going to be more for the women this time. I was breaking it, telling it to my wife. You know what I'm saying? And I believe it's going to bless the women of God, especially as we go forth in this ministry. You know what I'm saying? Because it's going to show the woman of God where she fit and how she should operate with her gifts in these days to come, in these New Testament times, in the house of the living God, man. You know what I'm saying? And we started, man. I'm going to just pick up where we stopped for the sake of time. And uh, we started, y'all. I'm going to give you a little quick recap. We started talking about, y'all, just going deep into the prophecy of this prophetic call, y'all, by the prophet Joel. 
who calls unto the priests of God prophetically, we say it, y'all, in a future day of a New Testament time. These New Testament times in which we find ourselves living in, y'all, these New Testament days I have in my notes in which we find ourselves living in. Joel is making a prophetic call primarily, y'all, and we went through it, man, and, and we said that he made a prophetic call primarily unto the priests of Israel, unto the priests of the house of God. We said also primarily unto the priests of the church of the living God, y'all. And it's crazy because it's in our times of our days, y'all which is these New Testament time period. You know what I'm saying? And we went deep into that just giving context upon how Joel, all commentators agree that he was prophesying about a future event that never took place yet. That's what make this book so exciting because we dealing with something, Nick, that never took place yet. We dealing with something that we never seen yet, y'all. <laughs> and we talked about it by going through the day of the Lord, talking about God bringing wrath and judgment upon one hand, y'all. But at the same time, simultaneously bringing restoration and blessing upon the other hand. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing that Joel is talking about. And the thing that excites me is we going to see it. <laughs> we going to live it. We going to experience it, y'all. Jesus spoke in the scriptures and he looked at the people and he said, it's a blessing to, for y'all to hear what y'all hearing. Because they had prophets who, who, who wanted to hear what Jesus was saying he spoke. Whereas the same days for us, we think that the, that the best was, was in the past, but we don't understand that the best is yet to come. God keeps the best for last, y'all. That's how he operates. And we talked about that, just, just talking about how God going to restorate us. In the book um, of Ezekiel, I think is mentioned, or, or Zechariah, God delivering us from the north. And he said that it's going to be so amazing that we're not going to speak upon the first deliverance in Egypt, yo. They're not going to even mention it no more. They're going to mention God delivering his people out of the land of the north, yo. You know what I'm saying? And that's how this prophecy is, because it's in these New Testament days, in these New Testament times. I have in my notes, man, we went over. You got to understand, y'all, that this is a call in these last days that's very, very important. It's very, very important, y'all. And we talked about it. We said that it was very, very important, y'all, because, because this is a call that's not just merely being made by the prophet Joel, but it's a call that's being made by the Most High God himself, y'all, in these last days. And we went in about it, just talking about these New Testament times, these times of grace, y'all. God himself decided to call unto the office of the priest, y'all. And then not long afterwards, God brings forth revival in the land. <laughs> That's what make this thing so important, man. And we took you to the scriptures in chapter 2, verse 17 in the book of Joel, how God said, let the priest. But then we went in into Joel chapter 2, verse 28, y'all. Further down in the scriptures, right after he makes this call unto the priest, we see God pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Mm. And I can't go too in-depth about it, but we talked about it, how that was so important. We gave you context and everything. You know what I'm saying? Based upon Peter speaking and saying that this happened in his days. Oh, God, without contradiction. And we gave you commentary on that. We gave you, you know what I'm saying, biblical truth on it, putting it and cutting it right, y'all, you know, by the grace of the Most High. You know what I'm saying? And then we kept moving, man. And I'm just going to keep moving for the sake of time, y'all. And we kept moving. And we talked about a second reason that this was so important. 
You know what I'm saying? We said that this was very, very important because this is a call that God makes unto the office of the priest, y'all. And as God makes this call, we said, we went in about it, calling unto the office of the priest. He's specifically targeting and directing this call unto the man of God. Who remember that, Nick? He was directing this thing. He was specifically talking, y'all, to the man of God, to the man of God. You know what I'm saying? We had in our notes that he was talking to the heads of the church, y'all, who are under the head of Christ. He was talking to the heads of the household, y'all. He was talking to the fathers. He was talking, y'all, to the men of God. He was talking to men in general, man. Making this priestly call unto the men of God. This office of the priest, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Because as God makes this call, you got to understand that this office of the priest is the office of masculinity. And we went in depth about that, just talking about it. It's an office that God had tailor-made for the men of God only. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And he's calling the men, and we're going to get in touch. He's calling the men to operate in the office of the priest. And we went in about it, how the priest, this priestly office got a stench upon it. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 got a, it got a bad taste upon it, so much so that nobody want to be the priest, man. Everybody want to be prophets. Everybody want to be kings, but nobody want to be the priest of the Most High. And we talked about this Catholic system. We went deep, y'all. You know what I'm saying? I can't get into it all, but you know what I'm saying? God had built this message through him giving me a revelation. I was weeping before church one Sunday, and he was showing me how, how the devil used this Catholic church, y'all. Who in the book of Revelations talk about it, how the, how the, how the dragon stumbled, y'all, but yet he caught himself. He caught himself to the church. He wrapped himself with the church, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And brought a stench. We told you how he took the cloak of Peter. Ooh, but God is returning it back unto the people of Judah. I mean, he's returning it back because the devil was able to take it because the, the dispensation had switched and went to Paul, you know, the apostle of the Gentile. But now things is coming back. <laughs> so God is bringing back the cloak again. He's bringing back the cloak again, y'all. So it was specific call unto the man of God. It's the office of masculinity, tailor-made for the man of God. And we talked about it's a Hebrew noun that means kohan, y'all. K-O-H-E-N, kohan. And it means the priest. For instance, in Genesis chapter 18, verse 18, talking directly of Melchizedek. He's a priest of God, of God most high, y'all. But it's also a word, word of a verb, y'all, meaning to serve as a priest, to do priestly things. You know what I'm saying? It means chief ruler. It means to own. It means a priest. It means a prince, y'all. It means a principal officer. And it just brought me back because we went deep about that. In Revelation, Jesus, he spoke about him, 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 him sharing his blood. And he said, I had made you kings and priests. Oh, God. He could have choose any other office, but yet he said kings and priests. And we think we only got to be kings to move things in the earth. You know what I'm saying? But we showed you how this priestly office is on the same level as a king, man. As a king, able to pull on the heart of God. Who? Able to bring change in situations, change in the earth, y'all. The priests of the Most High. And we got to pick that thing back up again, man. And it's going to start with us. It's going to start with the man of God. And we went in about it just saying how the man got to lead in this area. Got to go before, got to be an example in this area, man. Because it's an it's a, it's a office that's masculine, y'all. A Hebrew noun. 
You know what I'm saying? And we're going to get back to it, but I want to switch. We talked about how it's the same office of the pastor, y'all. The same office of the pastor, meaning, you know what I'm saying? Meaning being an office of masculinity at its root, y'all. You know what I'm saying? This office of the pastor is just like the office of the priest because it's tailor-made. It's set aside. It's set apart. It's kadash for the man of God. And a lot of time we got our women carrying all the load of the priest. Oh, God. It's the priest that's supposed to pray. It's the priest that's supposed to go to the most high God and move some things, y'all. And I'm going to get ahead of myself, man. We talked about it, and that's why Paul um, had said, man, and I'm going to just give you the scripture beforehand. But Paul had said in 1 Timothy 2, 8, y'all, he said, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubt, you know? You know what I'm saying? We went in, we said Jesus speaking the same thing through a parable, y'all, directly unto the man of God. In Luke 18, 1, the Bible said, then he spoke in a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Oh. We went even deeper, just going into Elijah being a man of God, a man of prayer, who was of the same nature of us, earnest and fervent prayer. But also we talked about Isaac, how Rebecca, y'all, how his wife pleaded with the Most High for child. She was barren. But sometime God will not move until the man of God prays. We done lost the art of that, y'all. We done lost the art of that, and God want to bring it back. Oh, God, because he's ready to flip the world upside down again, y'all. You see, you got to understand that in these, these New Testament times, it was Hebrew Christians that led the church. Oh, God. And it's coming back to that. It's coming back to that. It was Hebrew Christians who was the head of the church who flipped the world upside down, who brought the gospel to the Gentiles, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And God is doing it again, revealing to us who he is, bringing back an, our, our identity, but lining it up with the gospel, man. Because we've been through this information. This information ain't new. And one time when I preached, I told you that, that this was a, was a, was a, ooh, this was a, was a revealing that Jesus made unto the church in Revelation. But most churches don't want to pick it up <laughs> because they scared of losing members, but they just don't understand that if they do what thus said the Lord, the people going to come, man. Because where the word of God, where the, where the, where the, where the eagles, what he say? Ooh, where's, where the, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How you say that? Where the word at, Shane, is where the eagles going to gather. That's where they going to gather. You know what I'm saying? And to go back and tell it where we want to be, man. Y'all pulling it out of me, man, but let me take my time. By the grace of the Most High. You know what I'm saying? He was talking about how it's symbol to the office of the priest. And I just to go deep into the word pastor, y'all, it derives from the Latin word pastor, which means shepherd. Now, the Hebrew word for shepherd is rohi, y'all, R O. E-H, Rohi, which is used as a noun, as in a shepherd. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A place or a person, you know, or a thing. As a verb, as in to tend to a flock. And we just making the correlation how this priestly office was set aside for the man of God, just like the office of the pastor, you know? You know what I'm saying? And it literally meant in the Old Testament verses I have in Genesis chapter 29 and 7, it meant literally feeding of sheep, y'all. 
also in Jeremiah 23, 4. You know what I'm saying? And we're going to get into it. He was prophesying about a future thing, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Speaking of feeding the flock of the Lord in these New Testament times. And we will come back deeper and go deeper into it I have in my notes, y'all. But if you remember, man, we told you concerning the man of God and the woman of God. Just going deep into it. You know what I'm saying? We told you that, that, that both are made equal in creation, y'all. But both are made different in purpose. Ooh, made, made equal in creation, but both are made different in purpose. You know what I'm saying? And the Lord put this on. I wanted to move on, but he held me, y'all. So we're going to get into this, and this is going to be tailor-made for the women of God, but it's going to also bless the men as well because it's going to open a gate. It's going to open a door for the men to take their rightful place. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We got to get back to truth, y'all. We talked about how in society they have different cultures and traditions, y'all. Where the church have different cultures and traditions as well. And different cultures and tradition, it don't always line up with truth. <laughs> it don't always line up with the Logos, with the Bible, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And we could get caught up in tradition and not actual truth, y'all. So both are equal in creation. You know what I'm saying? I have in my notes, both are a dom, y'all. Meaning both come from dirt. Going all the way back to the Hebrew, y'all. Both are ish and isha, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Both are man, y'all. You know what I'm saying? In a sense of both being mankind made in his image, y'all. And we see this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Psalm boot, I think I gave it to you. The Bible says, so God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He created them, y'all. You know what I'm saying? He created them. So both are made, y'all, equal in creation. Both are made equal in creation. But to switch, y'all, we also said that both was made different in purpose. And we see this in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. You know what I'm saying? And I'm going to read it. Psalm Buddha, I gave you that one too. I need him to see that. And the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper compatible to him. I will make him a helper compatible to to him, meaning that she going to be just what he need. She going to be compatible unto him, meaning that it will make meaning that that I will make him a help me, y'all, compatible unto him in the order to help him fulfill purpose. In order to help him fulfill purpose, meaning that one was made to lead in the work, y'all, and to be head over the work, mm. but also meaning that the other was made to follow in the work and to be helper in the work, y'all. And this is the order that God himself had set, y'all, for both the man and the woman to fulfill purpose in the earth. Both are made different in purpose, y'all. And we gave you example just going in about Deborah and Barak. You know what I'm saying? How God had raised up Deborah to be a judge in the earth, a judge in the Old Testament time. But she understood, she had the wisdom to understand that though she was above, though she was in a, 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 a place of authority, you know what I'm saying? She understood that it was certain positions that she couldn't operate in. She understood that it was certain positions that was tailor-made for the man. You know? So therefore, she called for Barak. She allowed him to lead the army. She ain't had to call him, y'all. 
You know what I'm saying? And then we went in, man, just just giving a quote, even from the man of God, pastor. And it blessed me. I told you about that. How it blessed me, man. And he gave a quote concerning the different ecclesiastical positions in the church, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And it blessed me, you know what I'm saying, not only on a general level, but on an individual level. And he said it like this. He said, God is concerned with us getting to the end goal. He's concerned with us fulfilling our purpose, doing what we was born to do, but he's also concerned with how we do it. <laughs> he's concerned with how we do it, y'all. And that blessed me because I was living a life chaotic. I was doing my own thing, y'all. Lead my family, you know what I'm saying? Not even married, just, just all on the other side of things. And my mentality was to get it done no matter the cost. And when this man of God preached that, he blessed me with that. Because God is really concerned with it, y'all. He done set an order in the earth, you know what I'm saying? And he, and he, he, he desired for us to operate in it. Because it's all about being obedient. You see, a lot of us, we want to do sacrifices. You know what I'm saying? We want to we want to do something for God. We want to fulfill purpose. We want to do this and do that, y'all. But once we get out of um once we get out of obeying God, we operating just like so. And God got to look down and tell us it's better to obey than to sacrifice. Than to sacrifice. You know what I'm saying? And that's what's going on in a lot of churches. There's a lot of sacrifice. But when you look at it, they are out of order. It's not really obedience, y'all. And therefore, it can't be blessed by the Most High. It can't be blessed by the Most High. And God began to speak to me as I'm in my house going over this. He began to show me, he said, son, a lot of my people walking in blessings, but it's not my blessings. <laughs> Don't you know that the devil blessed too? Don't you know that men bless too? And the thing about it is, God's blessing is the only blessings that make rich and adds no sorrow. You see, the blessings of the devil going to make you rich, but it's going to be added sorrow with it. Oh, God. When you do things out of order, though you be blessed from it, it's going to have an added sorrow unto it, yo. You know what I'm saying? And this is for the men, but this is tailor-made for the women of God. For the women of God who operating in the pastor office, who operating even want to come down and be priests in this generation we living in. You know what I'm saying? And some of them, it looked like it's being blessed. Oh, God. Even being, uh, even being endorsed by men of God. Oh, even our favorite pastors sometimes. But yet it's out of order. Yet it's, it's not lining up with scripture, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And it's, and it's hurting the body. It's hurting us as a people, man, because we grew up with mama running everything. We grew up with big mama, even though daddy was in the house, y'all. You know what I'm saying? So God want to set some things back in order. So the man of God, the priests of God, could take his rightful place, man. Oh, with a priest of God stand up in these last days. With a priest of Israel stand up in these last days, man. In order for us to see revival, man. How bad you want to see your people come to the Lord? How bad you want to see them change? How bad you want to see them stop selling dope, stop shooting one another, man? I was a part of it, yo. We got to stand up as men and take our rightful place. But the women of God got to allow it. <laughs> he spoke it in Genesis. He said you're going to desire to be over your husband. And as you desire to be over him, you stopping him from playing the position that's going to bless you. <laughs> you hindering him. You're hindering yourself. Because though women might have the ability, Deborah had the ability, man. But she understood the ways of God. She understood the order that God had set, y'all. 
And she said, I'm not going to touch that. Oh, God. Even though I'm over, because it's not all positions, it's not all offices, and we're going to get into it. Because I want to encourage the women. We want to cut this thing straight, because in this ministry, the women are going to be used on a major level. But we want to we wanna direct it right. Oh, God, and I believe if it was being directed right, our people would be poo, totally different. Because we need our women. We need our women. You see, Deborah, she encouraged, you know what I'm saying, Barack. Barack didn't want to leave. <laughs> Barack told her, he said, I'm not going to do it unless you come with me. Now, Deborah could have been like, man, I'm going to do it. Go ahead. She was already in charge. But Deborah having wisdom, Deborah said, I'm going to come with you. Come on. Now, you're not going to get all the glory, but I'm going to come with you because I need you to play your position. Oh, God. For Israel to be blessed, I need you to play your position, man. You know what I'm saying? And that's the women of God when they understand sound doctrine. Because the Bible talks about in Timothy that the, the women, they go about, yo, always learning but never come into the knowledge of the truth. And that's where the false prophets, that's how they sneak into the women of God's houses, man. Whether they be through YouTube, whether they be physically. Because they're ever learning, but never come into the knowledge of the truth. They got a heart to fulfill purpose, and a lot of them really love God. <laughs> But the doctrine is not right. Mm. Doctrine comes from God. Man, it's God ideology. Man, it's the way God thinks. It's the way God sees things. And when you're not operating like that, you are coming against God. You know what I'm saying? God looks at it as pride. <laughs> because how dare you not do it my way? How dare you not have faith to trust me? We only preach because God tells us preach. The Bible says that it's foolishness to preach. He chose the foolishness of preaching to save men. But by faith we do it because that's the way he ordered. That's the way he ascribed, y'all. To save men and women. To change our hearts forever, man. You know what I'm saying? In this ecclesiastical position I have in my notes, y'all. You know what I'm saying? The clergy. God had set an order according to the apostle Paul, y'all. He had set order to it. And I'm going to read it right quick and go into it. Last time I read it, and that's why God beckoned me, because the enemy started cutting up. And I was going to just read it and keep it moving, you know what I'm saying? But, but I felt so much kickback in the spirit, man. You know what I'm saying? I felt so much kickback. You know what I'm saying? And then God began to show me what city I'm in. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Because there's different vices, different, different things that the devil uses in different cities, y'all, to get God's people out of order. To get God's people out of order. So this is a word that's tailor-made for Dallas, man. For Dallas. Because though we know right doctrine sometimes. <laughs> and we went in when we went with Jabez. We could not live it. We could quote it right. We could speak it right. But not live it. <laughs> Therefore, our, our lips are, are, are close. How I say that? You know what I'm saying? Our lips close to him, but what? Our hearts are far off, man. And this is a big vice in this city that we in, y'all. But in 1 Corinthians, we're going to cut it straight because God is bringing back the Hebrews. Oh, God. He's doing a new thing, y'all. He's making room, y'all. He's opening doors, y'all. 
If you don't believe that we them people by now, I don't know what you, what, what, what you, I don't know what you own. God is doing everything that he can to sound the alarm, y'all. In every church that don't pick it up because it's a move of the spirit. This never was given by man, y'all. It's the spirit that's doing this. It's the spirit that's waking men up. It was prophesied already. It's not by arbitrary. It was already spoken. So they can grab our cloak and say, take us to our God. Because we got to bring down this Babylon system, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And he's going to use the church to do it. Ooh, God used holy men eh, to write the scriptures. He's always looking for a holy vessel. But in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, it says, y'all, through 38, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now, this is Paul setting order in this Corinthian church, y'all. And if you know anything about the Corinthian church, they was out of order in every area. They was out of order with the gifts, and we're going to get into that later, you know what I'm saying, when we get into prayer. They was out of order, y'all, with sleeping with this one and sleeping with that one. Paul had to put some of them out of the church. They was out of order. But they was also out of order with letting women operate in a way that they weren't supposed to. And in Revelations, God speak about it. He mentioned it. He said, you let the holy Jezebel teach my people, man, and teach the women to fornicate. Because when we don't do things right, we might not even have that intention, might not even have that heart, y'all. But we open doors to some things. We open doors. That's why it's so important, oh, God, for, to do it the way God had said it. He chose the man of God for a reason, man. He chose the women of God to do certain things for a reason. We both got to play our part, y'all, to be successful. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He said, let the women keep silent in the church, y'all, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as unto the law. Also says, and in verse 35, because we going deep into it, it says, and if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husband. When he say they should not speak, when he say let them be silent, y'all, he's not saying that, that women can't speak in church. He's not saying that. He's saying women shouldn't speak in a way of authority. In a way of, of, of debating with the man of God. Because that's what's going on in the book of Corinthians. The women was raising up. Coming against the word. The man preaching. Coming against the word. Yo. Not only that. They wanted to take dominant positions. And teach the people. So Paul had to set some things in order. Paul said man let the women be quiet. And if they want to learn something, let them learn it from their husband. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. Because if you follow that manuscript, you know what I'm saying? It's going to force the man of God to learn the scriptures. <laughs> the man of God want to be able to teach his wife some things. He want to be able to tell his wife some things. You know what I'm saying? So if she humble herself, if she submit not to men, Submit to the word of God. Oh, God. Because when we submit to the word of God, we automatically submit to the Father. And if you're submitting to the word of God, I promise you, you're going to be submitting to your husband. You know what I'm saying? And we ain't going to say it's easy because we got a flesh. You know what I'm saying? But it's going, it's, you, you're going to be operating in it. And you're going to bless the man of God. You know what I'm saying? You go and ask him about the scripture. You submitting yourself. You're not trying to act like you know more scripture than him. <laughs> you know what it's going to do? It's going to set a fire in him. It's going to set a fire in him to go and read the word of God. You know what I'm saying? 
It's going to set a fire in him. Everything God tells us to do is for our benefit. <laughs> The scriptures say he don't tell us do nothing for his own benefit. Us as humans, us as daddies, us as mamas, sometimes we tell our children do things for our benefit. But God never operates like that. Every single thing he tells us is for our benefit. It's for our benefit, y'all. And that's what he said when he said, let them be quiet, man. You know? And we understand that because he goes even deeper in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 through 15, sound boot. Paul says it like this. He said, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over the man, but to be in silence, man. Because it's an order that God had set. He had made Adam first, Paul said. And all he's trying to do is set order. And a lot of times when we use common sense, oh, God, we're going to be right in the way that God wants us to be. Because when we talked about the pastor, when we talked about the shepherd, if we just use common sense, you know what I'm saying? And, and in Jeremiah, he makes this correlation that the pastoring, the priest, certain office, because it's not every office, and we're going to get into it, because there's many offices that the women of God could thrive in. <laughs> Take the church to another level. To another level. Stephen Darby preached it one time. He said, we need our women. We ain't trying to we ain't trying to trying to damn um sniper y'all or, or, or put you down. That's not what Paul trying to do. He trying to set it in order so you could be a blessing to the house of God, man. So you could be a blessing to your own house. The Bible says the foolish woman who pluck her house down with her own hand. And a lot of time it's not intentionally. <laughs> God in the name of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? It's based upon church culture and tradition. So that's what we're dealing with tonight. We're dealing with church, church culture, Mr. Franklin. We're dealing with doing it the way of the world, doing it the way of the church, or doing it God's way. That's what we're dealing with. For the household to be blessed in these last days. And God, God, God want to bless you, man. God want to bless us. In this season, God is blessing us, man. I'm telling you, man. He just want to set some things right. You know what I'm saying? So it's all about setting it right. And I brought up this, this about this shepherd just using common sense. God gave it to him. I'm going to give it to you and we're going to flow. Any, any father. <laughs> Any father, y'all, that's operating right and in line with the Most High, and even if they're not operating right, though they still might do it, because we're going to look at a, 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 a um, situation that the Bible speaks about twice. Ooh, and as I was studying it, a lot of theologians don't want to touch it. <laughs> They don't want to deal with it, but we got to cut it straight, man. We got to cut it straight so we could get a full understanding. You know what I'm saying? But no man of God, no husband, no father would have sheep or flock in the field and have a heart ooh, to want to send their, 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 their daughters to go and feed the sheep or to shepherd the sheep. Or to run with the herd, you know, the sheep, you know what I'm saying? No real father would want to do that, using common sense. Well, God is a father <laughs> in heaven. And he's way more better than men could ever be. And you got sons in your household, would you send your daughter to do the work of a shepherd? And God got sons and daughters in his kingdom. 
And he had set certain things for his daughters. <laughs> and he had set certain things for his son. He would never send his daughters out, y'all, to do the work of a shepherd. This is the work of a shepherd, y'all. Standing in the gap with the priest is doing, weeping between the porch and the altar. Y'all almost, I want to go so deep back into that because it's so important, but we got to keep it moving. You know what I'm saying? It's the office that God had set for the man. Peter, Paul spoke about it. Jesus spoke about it. God moved when the men of God prayed, man. Whoo, we about to see revival like never before. Based upon the word of God, based upon Joel, he calls for the priest, y'all. He tells the congregation to fast. He tells them uh, to repent, you know what I'm saying, about repentance. We talked about all of that. You know what I'm saying? It's, bringing me, it's coming back up to me. We talked about all that, but God said that the, the priest, it's like, it's like he, he built it up to a high place. Ooh, God. You know what I'm saying? To a climax. And then he said, priest, you go out first. Ooh, ooh. And we talked about the, 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 the priests as the blind guides. You know what I'm saying? Who want to point, who want to do this and do that and say that and do this. But they're not leading by example. They're not leading by example. Man. But to con continue to get into it, you know, it's common sense, man. And we putting women of God to lead the flock. Jesus looked at Peter and said, Feed my sheep. This is work, man. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and the most important part about it, the most scary thing about it, he made us to deal different. It's a tax that come with playing the role <laughs> of the office that he set for the man. You know what I'm saying? It was never meant for her to be talking to the serpent. That was Adam's job. <laughs> that's, not, that's why he never went talk to Adam in the first place. You know what I'm saying? She was operating out of office. Oh, God. You know what I'm saying? And for us as the priests, as the men of the home, we got to have the wisdom to see that and play our rightful place. Because Adam sat back and he allowed it to happen because God not going to come looking for the woman. He going to say, Adam, where art thou? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Adam, where art thou? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, who is a working together, it's submitting to one to another, I say, man, in Ephesians. You know what I'm saying? The man submitting to God. Because there's certain instances, and I'm going to bring that up, that, that God going to speak through the woman of God. The Bible says that it's the fool that don't hear it, his wife. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a fool that don't hear it, the words of his wife. You know what I'm saying? Because God will speak through the woman sometimes. And we got to be able to hear it and submit unto God. Submit unto a word, and that's what happened to Abraham. Sarah told Abraham to tell her guy in a, in, a, in a lad to go, man. Abraham was like, nah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's my son, man. But then God spoke. And God said, what? Hearken unto the voice of Sarah. And Abraham, being a man of God, he submitted. <laughs> he submitted. And it wasn't really him really submitting to, to Sarah. He was submitting to the word of God. You know what I'm saying? He was submitting to the word of God, y'all. And that's very, very important, man. Thank you. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. <laughs> you know, but to keep going. Thank you. My baby girl. But to keep going, y'all. I have in my notes. But what are some of the offices that's wide open for the woman of God 
to thrive in. Let's deal with that before we close. Where we at, wife? We good? Let's deal with that before we close, man. You know what I'm saying? And then we're going to go into 1 Timothy, y'all, next week and just go in and look at the different elements of prayer. But I got to be, I got to deal with God. Give me, y'all. It's not what I want to preach. It's what thus said the Lord. It's what he want to talk about. You know what I'm saying? It's what he want to bring to the forefront. You know what I'm saying? But what are some of the offices that's wide open for the woman of God to thrive in? Because remember, there's only some offices, I say, that's tailor-made to the man of God. Only some, y'all. Because God will raise up a Deborah and make her a judge. You know what I'm saying? So God is no respect of person. You know what I'm saying? He's no respect of person, y'all. So what are some of the offices that the woman of God can thrive in? Number one, I have evangelism. Evangelism. And if you know anything about me, I was head over to evangelism in Lafayette. You know what I'm saying? And we bringing that to Dallas, man. We going to hit them streets, man. We going we gonna to do campaign. We going to go out there and, 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 you know what I'm saying, pull out the black pots, y'all. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And feed our people, but more importantly, feed them with the word of God. You know what I'm saying? We going to go out and do the work of an evangelist, y'all. I have in my notes because all are called to evangelize. All are called to witness unto him according to the scripture. And we see this, y'all, in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 5. Sound boot, I gave it to you. Let's cut this thing straight right quick, y'all. Because the woman of God could thrive in her gifts, could thrive in her gifts and bless the house. Who in a major way, y'all? Bless the body, bless the kingdom of God in a major way, y'all. The Bible says in the book of Acts, Verse 1, Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 5. Look what it said. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then after that, Jesus tells them they shall receive power, y'all, to witness unto him. I have in my notes, we going somewhere, y'all have in my notes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We know, y'all, that, that there was 120 people in the upper room. And there were, they were not all men. It was 120 in the upper room, and they wouldn't all men, y'all I have in my note. But the women of God were there as well, y'all. And we see this in Acts chapter 1, verse 13 through 14. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's just naming the people that was there. It talk about Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James. The son of Aphius <laughs> and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. And this is where we want to be in verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brother. So the women was in the upper room. Now, why do we bring this up, y'all? We bring this up because Jesus gave them a command. He gave a command to all that would be filled with the spirit of God. <laughs> he gave a command, y'all. And we see it in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I'm going to read it and say, But you shall receive power from the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Judea in Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. So the woman of God could thrive as an evangelist. But how does she evangelize? How does that look? <laughs> because we see how it look in culture, but I want to show you how it look 
in the Bible. <laughs> because when I just say a woman can evangelize, you see how it's done in church culture. You see how it's done in church culture. But let's see how it's done in the Bible, man. You know what I'm saying? And we first see this, man. You know what I'm saying? And um, in John chapter 4, verse 28 through 30, y'all. And it's Jesus giving the gospel, preaching unto the woman of the well. She goes out and she operates in evangelism. Mm. Because it's all about speaking the gospel. It's all about telling them a man that then changed you forever. The Bible said that we overcome by the blood of the lamb, but also by the word of our testimony. You know what I'm saying? It's all about preaching the gospel. You know what I'm saying? And um, the woman, it says in 28, then the woman left her water pot and went away into the city and said unto the men, come, and come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. And this men right here is not just men, but it's mankind. Because as you go deep into the scripture, it's all about, all about the gospel. It's all about speaking the gospel. Jesus talks about later, he said he's willing that none should perish, but that all men, all mankind should come to the knowledge of Christ, man. You know what I'm saying? Should receive his gospel. So that's how it's firstly seen before we even get into the New Testament. We see this woman operating as an evangelist, Shane, as an evangelist. She goes out and she bids men to come. She said, come and see a man who done told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ, Nick? She's pointing them to Jesus. Oh, God. She went out, word of mouth. She went out to the highways and byways. She went over a congregation. She went out to the highways and byways. She wasn't preaching just authority over men. Now she went out specifically speaking what? The gospel. <laughs> Telling men how to get their souls saved. Telling mankind as a whole how to get their soul saved. So when we go out, you're going to be able to operate in this thing. And I done put together, man, so much literature and, and, you know what I'm saying, in the way that Jesus evangelized. And I broke it down for the evangelized, evangelism team in Lafayette. And they doing their thing, man. And whenever we do go out, they come into Dallas with us. They come into Dallas with us, man. You know what I'm saying? And I got some posters, man. I don't know if my wife posts them. I got You could go and check that out and see how we do that in Lafayette, man, because we bringing that to Dallas, man. And the women of God going to play an important part in this thing. They're going to be able to minister to the women, and we're going to get into it. But also in Acts 18, 26, talking about Aquila, and uh, Priscilla, you know what I'm saying? Aquila and Priscilla, y'all. You know, a husband and a wife evangelizing together. Verse 26, look what it says. So he began to speak boldly, you know what I'm saying? Talking about a man that was in the synagogue, y'all. He was in the synagogue and he began to speak boldly, y'all. In the synagogue, when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside, y'all, and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And sent, you know what I'm saying? They explained it to him more accurately. Because the scriptures say that he only knew about John's baptism, being baptized with water. But he didn't know nothing about being baptized with the Holy Ghost that would come from Jesus. He didn't know nothing about being baptized with fire, y'all. He didn't know nothing about being baptized, the baptism that Jesus would bring. 
You know what I'm saying? And it's the whole story. It's the whole story because water baptism is an outward confession. It's an outward sign of what Jesus did Ooh, on the inside of us. Baptizing us with fire. Ooh, God, you know what I'm saying? Bringing us under and bringing us up new, man. Sealing us with his Holy Spirit, y'all. You know what I'm saying? But also, Paul, y'all, within um, Romans 16, 1, 2, 1 through, yeah. Yeah, also in Romans, Paul sent greetings unto them as being fellow co-workers with him in the Lord Jesus Christ. Talking about Pris Priscilla and Aquila. But also in Romans, y'all, we're just talking about how the women can use their gifts. How the women can evangelize. You know what I'm saying? How it's done in the Bible, not how it's done in church culture. Let's cut this thing straight, man. You know what I'm saying? They pulled the man of God aside. Being obedient to scripture. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It wasn't saying that women can't talk in the church, but it's how we do things. It's not what we do. It's how we do it, man. God is watching. Ooh. And when you honor him, he say, I'm going to honor you. But them that don't honor me, he say, I'm a light little steam. Eh? I'm trying to show you how to honor him. Because if you're faithful with little, you're going to be faithful with much. You see, we overlook these little things. I was just telling that to a brother. How the Holy Spirit trained me. I would drop a piece of paper, y'all working. You know what I'm saying? Now, all the laws are governed by God. Ooh, he's the chief ruler. And I would drop that thing. And the Holy Spirit would tell me, go and pick it up. Mm. Now, I had a choice to make. That's a small thing. I had a choice to make. Man, that's just a paper, man. Stop that. Now, I could quench the Holy Spirit or I could grieve the Holy Spirit. Oh, I could be obedient, Miss Hannah. <laughs> Miss Hannah, oh, I could listen to the Spirit, be sensitive, and be obedient, Miss Hannah. So when the Holy Spirit spoke that to me, you know what I did? And that was young in my days. I was just coming to Christ. I went back and picked that paper up. And every time I think about what God got me doing now, he always bring me back to picking up that paper. <laughs> Something that nobody would, would think about. They would overlook that. But when you're faithful and little, Mr. Frank, God know you're going to be faithful and much. So I'm trying to get you to obey the little thing so he could trust you with much, woman of God. Ooh, so you could be a blessing to the man of God. Give room for them to grow. Give room for them to operate in the way that they're supposed to, man. Sometimes we got to help our men, man. You know the years of slavery. You know the things that they done did to us to, break, to block us mentally. They never wanted the man of God to rise. You know what I'm saying? They'll quickly give a job to a woman before a man. Why? Because they know there's power in the man of God. Who? that's power when a man is taking his rightful place in leading his family, being the priest of God, being the priest in the house of God, but being the priest in his own house, man. The devil can't do nothing with that, man. Ooh, he got to tuck his tail and run, y'all. You know what I'm saying? He got to tuck his tail and run. But in Romans, the woman of God, phobia, y'all, is mentioned by Paul as a servant of the church in Caesarea. But let's keep going. The woman of God also, who, yeah, I have in my notes. The woman of God also is able to teach. You know what I'm saying? She's able to operate in a teaching gift, y'all. You know what I'm saying? We see within the scripture that the woman of God I have in my notes is ordered to teach the word of God. She not only can teach, but he ordered her to teach. 
Meaning that he commands the woman of God to teach the word of God. Let's break this thing down. Let's cut this thing straight. It's not a, it's not a, he, he, he might want her to preach. I mean teach. He might want her to teach or even preach. You know what I'm saying? Because preaching is teach. He might want, it's not that he might not. He commands her, Miss Hannah. The scripture commands the woman of God to teach to break down the word, to study, to show herself, approve, oh God in the name of Jesus, to lead, man, in teaching. And that's what we want in this house. We want the women of God to be able to teach as well. Just as we raise up the men of God to be able to teach. You know what I'm saying? Different positions of teaching, but both teachings, both operating in the gifts that they was given. You know what I'm saying? He ordered them to teach the word of God, but to teach it unto the younger women. (laughs) Let's cut this thing straight because a lot of women want to teach and they got awesome gifts. But Paul is telling you, God commands you to teach, but teach it to the younger women. Oh, God. Now, when I say younger women, I'm not talking about just being younger in age. Oh, God. You know what I'm saying? We're talking about being younger in the age of the Lord. You know what I'm saying? One time I preached a message in Philly talking about the different ages and stages in the Lord. You know what I'm saying? We grow in the Lord. Our age in the Lord is not based upon a number like our age in the world. But it's based upon degrees of time. With the master. So you could be a young woman, oh, but an old woman in the spirit. You could be a young woman in age, but an elder in the church, man. So when he says, teach unto the younger women, he's not talking just about age, he's talking about age in the Lord. You know what I'm saying? Talking about age in the Lord. And that's what he says in Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. But as you speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, Paul breaking it down unto the man of God, the older men be sober, vigilant, temperate, and sound faith, and love, patience. And then he gets to it, and we're going to shut it down with this, y'all. He says, the older women likewise. Now, you know what that older is. He said that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderous, not given to much wine, yo. And that wine that 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 <laughs> that wine that's that's in our days, yo, is not the same kind of wine that was in the days of the Bible. You know what I'm saying? This wine in our days, yo, is built to get you drunk, because we know drinking is not a sin. But to get drunk is a sin. But who can measure that? <laughs> who can really measure when you're drunk or not? So a lot of us, we play by the line, yo. We play by the line. And Paul said, wine is an access. It opened doors, yo. Oh, God. Who can measure that? It's a different proof that was in the biblical days. From what's going on now, with it being in the hands of wicked men, Mr. Frank. Because God trying to get us to do this. Paul say, I lay aside every weight. Who that so easily besets me, man. He say, holiness without no man going to be able to see God. That's mankind, yo. But let's get to us so we can shut it down, man. He said, teach us of good things. Teachers of good things, that they may admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husband, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. You see, God wants the the women of God to raise up and teach the word so much so that all the women in the church 
is operating like Titus talking about. It's operating in a way that the word of God is not blasphemy. Not blasphemy. Chase. Paul said that a woman that's chaste, she's able to save her, her husband if he's not even in the Lord. Without a word. Just being chaste. But where are the women teaching that to the younger women? Ooh. They too busy want to preach at the, at the pulpit. Oh, God, when the women is going astray right under their nose. And they got gifts, Mr. Franklin, to teach the women. And they watching the women do things that the Lord would have them not do. Instead of pouring in and teaching the women, they want to teach on the pulpit. You know what I'm saying? And the women are the key to the household. The women, when they operating right, they set everything in order. And we're going to close with this because Sarah, your pastor, was just preaching, going deep into the book of Jasher. And I remember studying that. And me and my wife was talking about that, going deep into it, Paulie. And Abraham lied. <laughs> Ooh, I got a message talking about grace. Versus the law. When he fell into the hands of Abimelech, when he went into the land of Egypt, dealing with the Pharaoh, it's two different occasions. But Abraham, y'all, he lied. He told them that there was his sister. Now the Bible said that Sarah submitted unto the man as he was Lord. <laughs> And by her submitting unto the man as he was Lord, y'all, God hearkened unto her prayer. Both of them prayed. Both of them prayed, Mr. Franklin. You know what I'm talking about? It said Abraham prayed, but Sarah prayed. And the Bible said that the Lord hearkened unto the prayer of Sarah. And right after she prayed, she told Pharaoh, she said, he my brother. Ooh. What's the moral of the story? She submitted unto the Lord even though she was in agreement with Abraham and it was wrong. She knew he wasn't his brother. But God is able to make our wrong right when we decide to do things his way, y'all. She said in her mind that even though this might be wrong, Lord, you told me to submit unto my husband. You didn't say if he was obedient or not. You didn't say if he was, if he was a man of God or not. You told me to submit unto my husband. And God moved for the woman of God. And it saved Abraham's life. Whoo! Sometimes God just want to see if you're going to submit, woman of God. Yeah, your husband not right. He doing this and he doing that. But if you submit right, oh, God in the name of Jesus. God will save his soul. God will change him. God will get him to begin to do things that you always wanted him to do. And that's my story. When I was in the world, this little woman, this woman right here with me. Cutting up in the streets. She know that's not right, but if something in her was telling her, let me chill, man. Praying for me and everything. And by her being chased like that, not just running out, oh, God, in the name of Jesus. She was able to see God do a miraculous work, yo. When we cut this thing right and bring it back to the Bible, we be surprised what God gonna do. You gonna be surprised what God gonna do. And we bringing back biblical truths to, to, to align with God raising up his people again, y'all. Him putting his people back in the position where they was always meant to be and both gonna have to play their part, y'all. Miss Hannah, both gonna have to play their part the man going to have to stand up as the priest of God, but the woman going to have to allow him. The woman going to have to play her position 
and watch God do signs and wonders and miracles. Whoo! And bring a people that was dead and raise them back to life. <laughs> when we do this thing right, y'all. You know what I'm saying? So, man, look, if you heard the Lord in any way and you need prayer, we're going to open up the altar, Paulie. You know what I'm saying? So you could come and pray, man. We're going to open up the altar. Y'all come. Y'all come. Y'all come and pray. For the Lord going to do a miraculous thing. The Lord going to show up and break bondages and strongholds, y'all. The Lord going to lose some things, y'all. Things that been dead and dormant for years, God. Things that didn't, for the Lord, been on the whole, God. You're going to break through for us, Master. For you are able to show yourself strong, Lord. So, Daddy, I'm going to pray for your people, God. And then we're going to pray this sinner's prayer, Daddy, that you move and save a soul, God. For this is why we do this, God. We do this not for man, God. We do this not for man. We do this only for you, Daddy. That you might be high and lifted up. So, Father, I pray for your people, God. I pray that you move in a miraculous way, God. I pray, God, that you open, God, things that was dead for the end their marriage, God. You see the things that's going on in the secret places, God. I pray you make things right for the Lord. For you say sanctify them with that truth, God. That word is truth, Father. I'm praying, God, that you make for the Lord the marriages stick again. Make them strong again, God. Make them right again, God. I'm praying that you set the children in order, God. I'm praying that the single men, God, know how to operate. And the single women know how to operate, God. Let us do it right, Father, in Judah, God. Let us do it right, God, in Israel for the Lord. That the world might know and see that our God is with us. Oh, King, I'm asking you, God, to remove any bondage, any stronghold, any demonic thing that would hinder them. Loose them right now in the name of Jesus. Loose them in the name of Jesus, God. Let your power fall, Master. Break every band of wickedness. Loose every stronghold. We command freedom in the marriages, God. We command peace in the household, God. We command order in the church of the living God, Daddy. So let it be according to your word, Daddy. Sanctify us with thy truth, Daddy. Thy word is truth. And Father, we thank you for sending your son over 2,000 years ago of dying for our sins, our wrong, God. Because we none perfect, God. But as none righteous, no, not one, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Father. But Daddy, you said that if we confess our faults, God, that you are able to forgive us, but also cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So Daddy, we come before you thanking you for sending your son. Hear us as we cry out unto you. Repeat after me. Say, Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for sending your son to down the cross for all of our sins. But we know that we make mistakes. We not perfect. So we lay it at the altar. We be real with you tonight. We need you to save our marriages. We need you to save our churches. We need you to save our household. We need you to make us new, Daddy. And Father, we know that it's only by the blood of your son. For what could wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So, Father, I ask you to fill me with your spirit. 
Forgive me of my sins. Make me new. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, people of God. Oh, amen. Amen. For the Lord, I pray. For the Lord, the benediction over your people. I pray that the Lord bless you, that he keep you, that he cause his face to shine upon you, and that he bless you with shalom peace in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yes, Lord. And, and we would just ask that if we handed you guys a welcome card this evening, Nick, if you don't mind, um, hand it over to the gentleman that's going to the back of the room on your way out. We thank you guys so much for coming out to, to a Bible study tonight. Again, if you have not, please follow. Um, and, and Tim, if you can put these on the screen before we leave. We have a Facebook page, which is Philly of Dallas. We also have a um, Instagram page, which is PCC.Dallas. And um, we also have uh, a TikTok, which is Philly of Dallas. So if you would, uh, please go to those platforms and follow. Follow us on those platforms. We're going to be putting content on those platforms. And again, just making sure that we have, you guys have all the information you need to follow the ministry. But thank you guys again for coming tonight. We look forward to seeing you next week. Lord, stay the same. You guys have a wonderful night. Be safe getting home. And we'll talk to you soon. Amen. Just want to tell you, Lord, when